Okay, welcome to the uh, webinar. Thanks everybody for um, logging into this. The, the first slide here is just showing you uh, the uh, a few hints and tips. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear us properly. Uh, microphones are usually muted as a matter of default, which helps with everything. There is a reconnect button that you can use and the presentation slides. Uh, underneath the slides, there is a place where you can post questions. Uh, if you wish to uh, post the questions, we'll take those at the end, or if there's something that we really should cover during the, the presentation, then we'll take them there. There's also a chat function that you can use for any other communication you think is, is needed on that one. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I think we'll just crack on into the presentation now. Okay, so this morning we're going to talk to you about the, the partial discharge monitoring and avoiding failures using permanent PD monitoring. So myself, Neil Davis, and my colleague, Brad Monaghan, are going to talk about that. We'll share the presentation um, uh, duties over the course of this next 30, 40 minutes. Okay. So the contents, we will briefly talk about the condition monitoring and partial discharge, why we use those, um, the, the reasons for it, and some of the theory behind the, the different types of PD that we can come across. We'll talk about the handheld PD detection. So first, um, port of call normally for carrying out partial discharge and using PD for, for managing of assets is using handheld equipment, uh, which is very, very valuable. And we'll show you how that, that works. Um, and then we'll start looking at the testing intervals and some case studies through that. So the testing intervals of why you may win, uh, how often, how frequent you may need to do handheld and where the case is for uh, pull, pulling in permanent monitoring, showing you the benefits of permanent monitoring. All the way through that, we'll give you different case studies, show you examples of what we've been finding over the, over the years. We'll have a formal section at the end where we can, people can pose questions. So like I say, if you use the question section at the bottom of the webinar, we'll take those and we'll be able to go into a bit more detail if you require it on that. Let me just check about the polls. Ah, the polls, yeah. There are two polls underneath here as well. So if you go underneath and you'll you'll see two polls. One's uh, we recommend if you could look at that at the beginning, which is just asking you uh, how much experience you've got on there so we can gauge uh, what sort of level we, um, we're we looking at and uh, how, how experienced you are in terms of partial discharge. And there's another one, if you can do that at the end, which is looking at um, what further topics you may want from us to do in a future webinar. Okay, just a, a very brief one about EA technology in case uh, you're unfamiliar. EA technology started off as the Electricity Council Research Centre of the uh, UK electricity industry back in 1966. And uh, through that time, we actually started uh, working on non-intrusive and partial discharge detection in the 1970s and 1980s. By 1990, we uh, the privatization of the UK electricity industry started occurring and EA technology, a couple of name changes emerged eventually um, by 1994 as EA technology. Um, and then 10 years later, uh, there's a staff buyout. So we're now a, an independent employee owned company. 2009, we opened the office here in Brisbane. So we've been going now for 11 years here. And the focus is no longer just on the UK. Obviously, we're uh, five offices uh, around the world and working very much with electricity companies and owners, operators of high voltage networks, um, process industries, and everybody uh, completely globally now. Looking generally at asset management, management of, um, of assets, and also the future networks and the trans uh, transformation of the grid. So that's EA technology in a nutshell now. So an employee-owned independent company. 
So let's start with condition monitoring and, and partial discharge. So the reasons for, so we've got, uh, we've got, we're coming at it really from two different aspects. So people who are going into the substations, obviously one of the big things that we want to know is the, is, is to have confidence in the safety and the continuing safety reliability of the, the, the assets that we're working on and around. At the same time, we, we have over the, the years in, in the electricity industry, and you see it in process industry, where often there has been a taste of time-based maintenance where it's been maybe going into the assets a little bit too frequently. So uh, if you're going to start moving towards extending those maintenance intervals, you really need to be in a defendable position. So using condition monitoring can be a way where you can start pushing out maintenance intervals and targeting maintenance where it's needed rather than just on a pure time basis. The whole point is really to prevent these unexpected uh, failures and outages to the network. From an asset management point of view, we're looking at management of risk. So we want to de-risk, we want to prevent failures, reduce the probability of failure, um, and keep the, the network working in the most efficient and optimum way that we can. Uh, sometimes we want to extend the life of assets, reduce the capital expenditure, and we can do that de-risking it by reducing, again, the probability of failure using condition monitoring. And of course, as soon as you put assets onto the network, sometime in the future, they will become to a stage where they're no longer fit for purpose. We need to take them off the network. So using condition monitoring can be a way of prioritizing that and determining which is the optimum replacement time for switchgear, for cables, uh, transformers, etc. So that's really why condition monitoring is, uh, is used. If we look at the objectives of organizations then um, and why we're using condition monitoring, really they're summed up in these three different areas. Improve safety is always number one that every company that you, we would go to, every company we would visit, safety is the number one priority. Also, if you're looking at um, a, performing, a slightly underperforming network, you want to improve that performance, you can use condition monitoring to prevent that failure. If you, crucially, if you get the failing or the potential disruptive failing assets off the network before they disruptively fail, then that's cheaper than allowing them to fail. A, a fix before fail is always a cheaper option. Ultimately, if you, there are companies out there, very, very good um, performing companies in the world where they just concentrate on safety. Take the bad stuff off the network and everything else follows. These are not mutually exclusive. These are uh, very intertwined objectives. So we can look at that. If we look at, at this particular example here, this is a 30, from a 33 kV bus bar where partial discharge has been found. So you can see in here, you've, the evidence of PD that you would see in this is the, the green verdigree that you've got on the, um, what should be uh, nice metallic connections. And then on the shrouding of these bus bar connections, you've got the white powder and the treeing uh, and the sort of tracking that you get. All evidence of PD activity that's going on in this 33 kV bus bar. So if we find that, we've taken, taken the time to do a condition survey we've seen that something's uh, discharging. And then we've got to take a, a bit of a leap of faith to take that off the, off the network to, um, to open it up in, in order to, to do the investigation and fix that problem. So we need to take a bus bar outage. We're going to have to remove these, uh, these shrouds, these connections, we're going to have replacement parts. That's obviously going to have a cost. Um, that, that we have to deal with. But at the same time, if we will let that to happen, as you can see here is exactly is what happened. Now, the, uh, the switch gear is disruptively failed. So at this point, we're, we're not in the situation where we're in control. So this, is, this failure has happened wherever it may be, usually four o'clock in the morning on a, on a Saturday or something, you've got overtime. You've got unexpected uh, switching to do, lost production or lost uh, elements of the network. We've got the carbon um, generated from the fault area now. So that carbon, the, the dust, the debris has now gone up the bus bar. So it's affected larger components, maybe down into the CT chamber, down to the circuit breaker, 
in the cable box depending on the configuration of the um, uh, of, of the switch gear. Just a few um, comments here. Okay. How much cheaper is it to fix before failure? And then Andrew's commented repair before failure cost is typically orders. Of okay. Money. So the, the, the sort of failure, we, we would typically look at that for even for a cable, if you can uh, take a cable out of service um, before it fails, we work that as, as being usually about a third of the cost of, um, of letting a, a, a cable fail. And that's usually the, cheap, uh, the smallest ratio. For switch gear, we're looking at multiples. So let's say this was a, a bus bar on, on a primary zone substation, um, 33 kV. So, so a pretty large cost to take an outage on this to, to, to fix it up before it fails. So let's say call that $50,000 $50, maybe. It's not unreasonable when you take in labor and, and take in parts and things like that, generation costs. If we're looking at this now where we've got the situation, we could have a, an outage that lasts particularly um, weeks or months longer. We've got to replace these components. We've got to start looking at the cleaning. Potential what you have when you get a failure that goes into the bus bars into other areas is you get secondary faults. So that starts coming up. So we can be looking at multiples three, four times the cost of that. Certainly when... Um, one of the companies that has done a, a big study on this in Singapore Power, uh, they looked at that cost and the, um, the the savings that they were making were in that order of, of between two and four times um, the cost, possibly more than that at times, depending on the voltages that they're looking at or the cost of um, that you're saving. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over. Brad's going to just do a section on partial discharge. Okay, so what is PD? I'm just going to go a uh, quick brief overview of, of what is PD. So there's an international standard called IEC 60270, and inside that standard, there's a, uh, a definition of what partial discharge is. The definition talks about... Um, insulation breakdown but not a full breakdown from either phase to phase or phase to earth so it's talking about partially bridging out parts of the insulation the uh, the defects that cause this are um, electrical uh, the defects that cause PD cause high electrical stress points and those uh, defects will either be on the inside of insulation or on the outside of insulation So there are three main types of PD classification. We've got internal discharges, and that's where you've got some sort of split or crack or void or air gap um, inside an insulation layer where discharge will, will build up because of high electrical stress. Then we've got what's called surface discharge, and that's where you have defects on the outside of the insulation systems. Um, that can either be touching the surface of the insulation or it can be very close to the insulation and you have a high electrical stress built up across that area. The third one we have is corona discharge. Corona discharge occurs when you've got a, a physically, a very sharp point, so a, a pointy end of a, of a lug or a, some sort of bolt where uh, there's a high electrical stress point at that area and it effectively ionises the gas near it, uh, which is usually air and um, causes discharge to occur. So we have three different types of discharge here and there are different techniques that are more effective at, at uh, capturing the signals given off by these three different types of discharges. So if we think about discharge a little bit more, and uh, a good way to think about discharge is to think about physically sparks occurring. So sparks will give off light because you can see a spark. Sparks will give off heat because it's a, effectively a tiny little lightning bolt. It will give off a smell because it ionises the air or the gas around it. It will give off a sound because you can hear a spark. And it will also give off electromagnetic waves. We can't see those electromagnetic waves, but there are in, there is instrumentation that detects the electromagnetic waves. So if you walk into a substation or, or close to a HV asset and you, you can either see some sparking going on or you can see some heat or evidence of heat if you can smell gases that, that shouldn't be in there namely ozone gas or if you can hear discharge and sparking and arcing going on you've very likely already found 
partial discharge just by using your own sensors. Uh, a lot of the time it's not that, um, it'll be at a very large state if your sensors can already pick it up. So we use instrumentation to find that. The instrumentation looks to um, detect ultrasonic sound waves that are being emitted by typically surface activity. And also we use instrumentation to detect the electromagnetic waves given off that effectively every time a spark happens. So let's go into those four techniques. So here we have four techniques. We've got what's called the transient earth vol voltage technique. Um, what we do with that one is we are detecting the tiny little voltage rises that occur uh, that is a byproduct of the EMF that is given off when sparks occur or when PD occurs. We have ultrasonic uh, airborne microphones and contact probes and, a, and an ultrasonic dish that will listen for the sound and the crackling and the arcing and, and corona as well. Corona will give off sound and we listen in the ultrasonic range using these microphones to detect PD that we can't hear with our own ears because a lot of the time our ears won't hear them. Uh, when you've got PD inside cables, uh, a very effective way of detecting the PD is by using what's called RFCTs or HFCTs, that stands for radio frequency current transformers or high frequency current transformers. And that is effectively picking up the EMF signals given off by a spark and those EMF signals are bouncing up and down the cables and re reflecting off different impedance um, changes within the cables. Another technique we use is the UHF technique. So when PD occurs, it will um, give off ultra high frequency uh, signals and we can detect that using UHF detections. Uh, does PD occur in low voltage applications? We've just had a question through from, from Nathan. And, and typically, no. The, the, by definition, it, it occurs at high voltages uh, because the electrical stress is high enough at that point to give off PD signals. Okay, next slide. So handheld PD detection. So handheld PD detection, the, the, the first one is um, transient earth voltage measurement or TEV measurement. So to detect TEV signals, we get um, we have a we have one of our engineers here, his name's Thomas. He's holding an ultra TEV plus two, which is one of our main handheld instruments. He's holding that against the metalwork of a, a ring main unit there. What the instrument is doing is it's got a little transient earth voltage sensor in the end of the instrument and it's detecting the tiny little voltage rises that are occurring on the metalwork, which is a byproduct of PD activity and the EMF activity given off by PD. So what we do is we hold that, um, the ultra TEV plus two sensor, the TEV sensor, against different parts of the switchboard to detect where signals are coming from the highest. Uh, so we would detect at the, at the cable box, at the circuit breaker, CT chamber, at the VT chamber, on your bus bars, also on the outside of your high voltage cables is a very effective spot to test. When we go outside uh, a switch room, we can t uh, test for, for TEV signals on, on underground cables going up poles, on the poles themselves, on the earth straps as well. So um, if, uh, TEV nominally picks up internal void type PD and when you have where you have con contact type issues where sparks are jumping across gaps. So the next tech, oh, so another another slide here on internal void PD. So here we have the output of the UltraTev plus two. So what the outputs are, we get a decibel level, that's where you can see the 38 dB written there on your screen. We also get a pulse per cycle count and on this screen there, it's written as 3.04 pulses per cycle. And that's counting up how many times per sine wave that discharges are occurring. We also get uh, what's called a, a phase resolved partial discharge pattern. And on the, on the bottom left graph there, you can see two waves of, of activity coming up. And that, fit, that phase resolved partial discharge activity is showing the user where on the sine wave with, with reference to your 50 or 60 hertz um, frequency of your network, where the PD events are occurring with reference to that. So we can analyze those pictures and figure out, you know, what type of PD is occurring, whether you're detecting noise, whether you're detecting internal void, is it single phase, two phase, three phase, all these types of things. Um, when, so this one here is a, a case study where 
we have um, detected that those TEV signals on the outside of a 22,000 volt cable that's running up that cable tray there. Um, we've used all those the we've used all that data to come up with the conclusion that there is very very likely internal void PD up on top of that uh, transformer where there's actually a high voltage joint up there, or it could be in one of the three terminations that terminate onto the top of the transformer. So all of these pieces of information were used to come up with with an answer. Have we found PD or not? How bad is it? What type is it? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the next technique is ultrasonic measurements. So ultrasonic activity occurs um, when PD activity is, is, is occurring. It's the sound given off by PD activity. So we use microphones, we use parabolic dishes, and we use what's called a contact probe as well to listen for the, the effectively the sound waves that are giving off every time a spark occurs or whenever the corona is occurring. Um, here we have one of our engineers, it's Thomas again. He's got his headphones on and he's using the Ultratev Plus 2 with an airborne microphone. And he's trying, what he's effectively trying to do is listen into all the different high voltage chambers at a switchboard or at a, or at a ring main unit and listen into each chamber to effectively test for, um, for sound and we listen for sound. Once we get the sound, here we go across to the next one. Once we, once we detect a sound, we have to figure out whether it's being, that sound is being caused by PD activity or whether it's being caused by, by some sort of noise because you do get interference. You do get other things that will emit sound in the ultrasonic range that the instrument picks up. So to help the user, we've got a, an algorithm built into the instrument. It will classify the noise that it's hearing as either, oh, I should say that the sound that it's hearing as either noise, so not PD, or PD. So um, it does that as you are taking the reading and it gives the user further confidence in, in what they're trying to test. You'll also get a decibel output. So on the left there we have 21 decibel microvolts. On the right we have 29 decibel uh, microvolts and that's the amplitude of the sound. Um, you also get a phase resolved partial discharge pattern and that's what those two green patterns that you can see on the left and the right there are. So I'll just play the, the one on the left hand side. So this is a sound that's produced by magnetic noise. So this would have been listening to a, a VT and it's the sound that the VT is giving off as it's transforming electricity. So that sound there, hopefully everyone could hear it, was heard inside a chamber and it gave that phase resolved partial discharge pattern. The algorithm classified it as noise. It gave an output of 21 decibels. So that's the information taken from that. You also have to take into account what sensor you are using and what you were testing to help figure it out. On the right hand side, we have a proper PD source. Uh, I'll just play the sound from that one now. So that one there is from a discharge and defect and we can hear the crackling and the arcing and sparking going on. So the algorithm's classified it as PD. Uh, next slide please. So here is a, another real life example. We have, um, this one here was on the side of the road at a ring main unit um, in Australia. We can visually see PD occurring between the two phases where you can see that white discharge occurring. There's high electrical stress points there and, and there's defects in between those two phases where um, there's too much electrical stress, it can't hold in the volts and PD activity is occurring. It, it may also be being affected by contamination within the box such as dust and debris and all that sort of stuff. High humidity as well within the box, maybe um, uh, speeding up the process. But this discharge was, we could hear it with our own ears. Um, it was at a very high amplitude. It was at 47 decibel microvolts, which is very high. We have the phase plot there that we've captured with the Ultraserve Plus 2. And this is what the sound sounded like. And it, um, we have found that one, that one there was found visually, it was found with our own ears, but the, the instrument was also able to take a recording of it and um, help further diagnosis. The algorithm there predicted 100% certainty that, that the sound was being caused by partial discharge as well. So it uh, gives further confidence again, even though we can see it. So that's just another case study. 
Okay, so I'm going to um, start looking at testing intervals. So you can see from the, the case studies that uh, Brad has been showing there, the we're getting a lot of really good results. We're getting very good certainty. Nowadays, we're seeing, you know, that we're definitely getting an internal void discharge in that cable joint. We, we're definitely getting uh, partial discharge activity identified in, in, um, in cable terminations in that, particular, that last example. The question then becomes, how frequently must I um, look at testing? And that's the difficult one. When I first started doing this, so when EA Technology started really pushing um, the use of this into the electricity industry uh, in the UK back in the, the, the 1990s, 80s and 90s really, we started looking at uh, maybe every once every two years was a start, good starting point. Uh, one of the reasons for that is if we go back there, we're looking at very much uh, void type insulator uh, problems. So compound insulated cable boxes, uh, compound insulated chambers and oil filled uh, switch gear. And, and if you're looking at a void degrading uh, through the um, through bitumen and things like that, it's usually quite a long time, a long process before it goes into failure. As we started moving towards using uh, air insulated terminations, so we started going to uh, dry terminations, we uh, more air insulated switch gear. We start moving away from porcelain, going into cast resin and resin type, uh, plastic type insulation. Uh, we started seeing more and more uh, surface type discharge occur. At that point, you can get much quicker um, degradation to failure, particularly if you've got a poor environment. So nowadays, what we tend to say is uh, that there is there is quite a, a wide variation. So some failures will occur and, and take a long time before it gets to failure. Some will uh, accelerate quite quickly away. So if we look at the classic RCM type approach of looking at the P2F curve, uh, which we got here, the point at which you can uh, a defect can be detected to the, the time at which it fails. Uh, if, if we knew that we had a very defined period of time, uh, say uh, one year, then the RCM approach would be to say to uh, halve that and make a testing interval of every six months. Unfortunately, like I say, the different types of defects um, tend to uh, have much different P2F type intervals. For that reason, then really using consequences more the approach that people are taking to determine how um, how often, how frequent, and and also the um, the acceptance of failure. So the 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 less frequently you test, the more uh, probability you will have of a failure. You're reducing the probability less. So for low consequence assets, maybe once every year or once every two years. Medium consequence, you having that coming down to every every year or every six months. For high consequence assets, then maybe looking at every every month, every uh, one to three months, or permanent monitoring. So uh, EA for here in Australia, we're doing permanent monitoring for people. We're also doing testing in certain critical assets where where people have, have got known defects, and we're testing them every once one uh, every month so that we can um, uh, get the, the best warning of failure. So it's a variability and the higher the consequence, the more the business case, the easier the business case for permanent monitoring. So let's look at an example where the P2F curve was relatively um, short or P2F period was short. This is one where in, in the UK, EA Technology working with one of the, the DNOs had installed one of our monitoring systems. Um, it was part of a, um, a prototype and long-term testing. Nobody had really taken the trouble to um, instigate the communication. So nobody was actually looking at the data. And this is a classic case of people uh, can put, uh, see a project to, to monitor switchboards and see the project as putting the monitor on whereas really the project starts when the monitor is installed because you've got to be looking at the data. It was a high risk, um, quite a critical switchboard. It was near a river. Uh, it's a particular type of switch gear that doesn't particularly like high humidity and, and has been known to discharge. So we installed the monitor in November 2014 and in, at the end of July 2015, we received a phone call that the substation blown up and could we investigate the reasons? Uh, so the substation blows up and people say, oh, we've got a monitor on that. Um, possibly you wanna do it slightly different to that. 
So the the failure investigation team looked at it, and we've got this uh, black crispy switch gear here, and then we looked at the data. So the monitor luckily survived. The switch gear potentially ha uh, hadn't. The monitor survived. So we've got that um, information that we can then look at to see how it's progressed. So if you look at the graph here, uh, in in February, March, then we got very little going on towards the end. So the 29th of March, we've got a step change in activity. So the ultrasonic alarm level has, has been breached if we'd have had the alarm level um, instigated and communications um, enabled. That's then gone up. So by the time we're into middle of April, May, we've got a pretty high steady level of about 40 decibels of ultrasonic and it stays there until the 28th of July, pretty flat. So you don't often get an upward trend. So trending ultrasonic is actually a difficult thing to do. So by the 28th of July, so three or four months later, we've got a disruptive failure. So if we'd have gone in for an annual test and we'd have gone in for that annual test, January, February or early March, we wouldn't have seen something. If we'd gone in um, between sometime between uh, the 1st of April and the end of July, we would have seen the problem. We could have dealt with it if we'd have dealt with it quickly enough. So the consequence of that was a large part of the city was left without, um, without electricity for about eight hours. So the, the SADI safeties, or in the UK as the terminology is customer minutes lost and customer interruption fines, uh, totaled over £300,000. So around 600,000 uh, Australian dollars. Um, you've obviously got to replace the assets and you've got to, to change all that, all that direct cost on top of that. So a monitoring system would have given about three months worth of warning to, warning to allow that change to happen. And a partial discharge survey on an annual basis may be a warning for chance of detecting that. And for that reason, with that sort of critical asset, you can see the, the cost benefit of uh, installing permanent monitoring. So where, where does monitoring, um, what, what, what does it give us in terms of benefits? And, and obviously it's, it's permanently there, so it's, it's given us um, better capability of detecting those short P2F failures. It's also, it's also installed when we're under different environmental conditions, different network conditions, um, and also, of course, la less labor intensive. Like, like I say, at, at times we're going into particular substations every month or every three months. If you're going into a same substation month after month, generally or potentially detecting nothing, um, the, uh, the veracity of the, of the, um, of the survey has got a tendency to slip. You start, you know, you start becoming blasé. You start stop paying quite so much attention of that. Whereas, a, obviously, a permanent monitor is doing there and sitting there and doing its job. So let's look at a couple of examples. This is this is one where we've got um, two sources of TEV depending on the time that you're you're testing. So the blue line is a nice constant. Uh, constant source of, of partial discharge activity and the orange line is a higher one that's coming in and out based on either network conditions or loading or something in that particular nature. You can see that actual one is going up to higher levels of activity when it is active. So depending on the time of day that we're testing or the which day we're testing, we, we could miss that orange um, that orange source of activity. Looking at an ultrasonic um, example, surface discharge will be much more affected by the uh, the relative humidity in the atmosphere compared to an internal void where it's it's um, it's contained within the insulation. So in this particular one, you can see um, if we went into our substation on the fourth of September, then we'd find nothing. We go in there on the fifth of September. And during the 5th of September, the humidity has reached, has, has gone up there, it's increased above the 60%, up towards 70% RH, and the uh, discharge has started off. By the time that starts then falling by the 6th of September, again, we've missed that. So 
these environmental conditions can trigger discharge activity. Sometimes if you've got lots of tracking, it can be surprising how degraded the insulation is, which is still being, um, which is still coming in and out and effectively stopping when humidity is getting lower levels. So that's the sort of thing, again, the benefit of a monitoring system. So the next case study shows you uh, a similar thing where we've got a, a, a discharge happening and it would have accelerated through to failure, except this time with the prevention, uh, the, the monitoring and the, the activity is prevented to failure. So this particular instance was a, was a large switchboard, so it's 68 panels of 11 kV switchgear. Monitor was permanently installed uh, using a transient earth voltage and ultrasonic sensors. You can see the top graph there, we've got about 18 months of basically nothing going on. And then all of a sudden something kicks up at the end. So if we look at this graph here, if you look at the bottom graph, that's 4th of August, that's something happened. And, and of course that's Friday. So Friday morning, we received the, um, the indication that the, the discharge has started triggering. And we phoned up the, uh, the electricity company in this particular case and indicate that we've, we've got a problem happening. So at that point, we've, we, we know that we're gonna have a little bit of time. So a planned outage is, uh, it, an outage is planned in. So two weeks later, there was an outage planned in to take, uh, to go and investigate. We actually went into the substation uh, around this, uh, just before that happened, and we're able to take a um, handheld survey or handheld um, handheld measurement. And you can see that, and, and again, on the, uh, the Ultratev Plus is showing that, which is two phase locked, 180 degrees apart um, uh, clusters of activity, which indicates PD and a uh, the sound clip which which isn't playing which, <laughs> which is uh which was again indicative of pd and the algorithm was classifying that as partial discharge activity okay okay so the, the the vt was taken out of service uh two weeks after we initially detected it and you can see uh we're in a bit of a state here so the, we've got major cracking on that cast resin component. We've got burning happening, burning and pitching, soot and debris building up. So we've, we've got arcing taking place on, on here. How long would it have taken to fail? That we can't be 100%, but small number of months, maybe a few weeks more, more than this. So let's just call it again, we possibly got a one in four chance of detecting that during a, um, a an annual survey uh, but in this particular case we're monitoring it we've taken it out we've had no disruption to the the network so no um no unexplained outages no network problems taken out prevented that so that justifies the uh, the monitoring of that very large switchboard for numbers of years so why why do people install monitors and it's really comes for a number of different things really. So critical switchboards, high consequence, which is what we've talked about. Uh, if you know that you're going to have to replace a, uh, an asset soon, it takes time to get that, that off and you're looking at extending the life during that period. So um, extending the life of, of the, the asset for or away by de-risking it. Of course, staff, staff safety, if you're working on one bus bar and you've got the other one live, people are in that, that switch room for an extended period, people put monitoring on the other half of the switch gear. If you're looking to extend the life of the asset, then deferring capital expenditure um, is, is another driver behind this. Um, of So people are using all these different reasons for installing monitors, which is why more and more monitoring is going in nowadays. Just one example of to show you the level of risk that can be reduced by putting a monitor on. So this is uh, this is one that we did for one of industrial customer. We did a, a benefit or an analysis of the risk that they were running for a switch gear failure on a critical switchboard. And uh, what we've got is three classifications of failure here. Catastrophic failure is shown in yellow. Um, a degraded failure, so relatively contained is shown in gray and an incipient failure is the one where we've gone in 
and we've been able to take it out. So the previous case study was an incipient failure. There is some cost to go in there to look at the VT, take the VT out, replace the VT. But what we're trying to do is reduce the, uh, the uh, disruptive failures, the catastrophic failures, and drive them down into the orange levels. So you can see if we look at the third to uh, the third block of um, the graphs here, what we've got is with a monitor on, we're driving those, uh, driving that yellow section down to being much smaller. It increases the orange section, and that's for a degraded bit of or, or a piece of switch gear, and basically uh, at the end of its book life. And you can see the risk that that is running with a monitor on is actually less than the risk of the previous period where it was going through its uh, the main part of its life. So putting a monitor on an older switchgear means that it will be running less risk than it did for the many uh, many years it was running successfully without monitoring on there. So it's a reduction in risk that helps you justify that um, extension of life and uh, the capital expenditure. Just had a question, Neil. Um, okay. Are there faults that PD cannot detect? There are faults that PD cannot detect, and, and for that reason, um, on the graph that we've got here, uh, you can see that we're not completely decimating by putting the monitor on uh, all of the yellow um, uh, failures, and we're not completely decimating all of the grey failures. So there will be certain things, the mechanical issues may that may happen that will cause disruptive failure. The the, the statistics would, would indicate that roughly uh, one in eight, so 80 to 85% of failures are associated with partial discharge activity. So there will be a proportion of failures that don't occur, but if you're going to do one thing and one thing alone for switchgear or for cables, then partial discharge is the one that will get you the most, uh, most of those failures and reduce that. But as we're showing in this graph here, there will be some that would be left, um, left behind and not detected. Okay, Brad. Okay, so astute HV monitoring. I'm going to take you through the hardware firstly. So we've spoken a lot about the the monitor and monitoring itself. Um, can I just maybe turn that um, just so we can see what's under there? Okay. All right. Yeah. So we'll talk about the hardware. So on the right hand side there, you can see two pictures. The top picture is the accessories and the nodes of the hardware, and the bottom picture is the hub, it's the central hub. So what you have is a fully integrated modular system that can be extended to cover how big a switchboard you want to cover. It can be brought back down to, if you just want to monitor to a small section of area. Uh, so all the, the nodes effectively get daisy chained up. To install the system, it's non-intrusive. All the sensors uh, attach magnetically to the outside of your switchgear. So you, you can move them around. There's no drilling, there's no bolts, anything like that, as long as your metal is, is ferrous, which it usually is. Um, uh, there's no shutdown required to install the equipment. We put it on the outside of the equipment. Um, so the, the sensors that uh, are used within the uh, the the equipment is we have TEV sensors inside those blue nodes that you can see on the right hand side. <coughs> we also have uh, designated TEV sensors and we have designated TEV aerials. And what we do with the aerials is we, we set them up around the room, uh, usually on all four corners of your switchboard, to uh, detect any um, external noise or external EMF waves that are coming through that, that look like TEV signals to the, to the system. Um, we also have ultrasonic sensors. So that black uh, sensor you can see in the top right there is a, a, a microphone that you can move around. It's the exact same microphone that the handheld equipment has. And all the TEV sensors is also, also have the same TEV sensor in it as the handheld equipment that I, I went through earlier. What we do with those microphones is we focus them into each of the, the, uh, the HV chambers, into your cable boxes, into your buses, into to listen to your, your, um, the spouts behind your, your circuit breakers, so your cable spouts and your bus spouts, all those types of areas to listen to any crackling or arcing or sparking that's going on. We have RFCTs that we can attach to uh, cables, so we put them on the outside, um, on the screens of your cables to detect cable PD. 
We have temperature and humidity sensors that will log the temperature within the room and the humidity within the room or at the location of that sensor. So you can put them in different spots of the room and it will log all the temperature and humidity um, as it goes along. We have external comms. So what we usually do is we plug in a 3G or 4G modem to the hub and that acts as a standalone communications link so it doesn't have to interact with your company's um, uh, what's it called LAN and uh, so they're, they're, there's generally no corporate network issues and, and cyber security issues because it's it's completely separate so the hardware can either be, be purchased or it can be can be loaned and um, with us so the next one here the next slide here is is the service that we offer so we call it the astute monitoring service so if we, if we are to uh, deliver this service, what we always do is we, we come out to site and we conduct a PD survey of the switchgear that we're gonna put the monitor on. And that's for, for two reasons. The first reason is to um, figure out if there's any PD happening at the time, capture all the phase plots, capture all the information we need to about it. And then we, secondly, we focus the sensors to be able to uh, detect and monitor the PD activity that already is there. And then what happens is we, we monitor from there. So we, we will monitor the PD activity remotely. The data that is being logged by the monitor um, gets stored locally within the machine and it gets uploaded to the cloud server. Um, if a PD event occurs above set threshold levels, uh, we will receive an alarm and then our, our analysts uh, will look at that alarm figure out whether it's a, a true PD event or uh, what the next steps are to take uh, if it is if it is um, deemed to be PD. Then we inform the customer, whether that by, be by email or phone call or however uh, the customer wants to be informed. We then move from there and we continue to monitor the situation. So um, until they can, you know, get a shutdown and, and have a look at it. All that time they receive the expert advice and guidance from us. They can ask us questions at any time. And we, we also give reports. So we will do reports at set intervals if that's how we want to set it up or uh, we can also do exception reporting and that is effectively giving you guys a call uh, when something's happening. So the benefits, the benefits of monitoring. So your switch wall will be switchboard will be monitored 24 seven. As Neil mentioned earlier, you do get intermittent uh, signals coming through that, that can be caused by changes in humidity. It can be changed, but caused by um, network events such as high voltage switching, too much load, go, or not too much load, but load flows can affect PD activity as well. Uh, and because everything's time stamped and everything's logged, you, you can actually um, cross reference it with things that are going on in your network to see what's kicking off this PD activity. Uh, it will reduce your risk of failure of your switchboards. Um, it will help you make better decisions in terms of, right, we have PD here, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to manage it? Uh, it will take the, um, the onerous of PD monitoring off you and put that on us so that you guys can do what you need to do, uh, whether that be running your network or, or you know, digging coal out of the ground, whatever it is that your company does help support your money decisions and it will help give maximum availability of your uh, assets. We have a few more, few more case studies here of, of um, the, what we've found in the past. So this one here is a 11 kV switchboard. It is um, uh, where we have done conducted a benchmark survey. We've identified PD within the cable box that you can see there highlighted in red, uh, pitch fill cable box. We straight away advise the customer that there's a high level of PD inside that uh, cable box. What, what we then advise them to do is uh, shut that cable box down to reduce the risk and that's what they did. And in the top graph there on the left hand side you can see that um, you can see that the activity has dropped off as soon as they have uh, taken that asset off the network. The bottom graph is the phase phase resolve partial discharge pattern that was captured by the Z plus two. And in, within that, we can see that there's multiple discharge defects on multiple phases by analyzing that. Okay, another, we'll get to the questions in a second, I think. 
Yeah, we've got a few questions to, to answer yep. once we've gone through this case study. Yeah. We will get to the case to, um, to the questions. So here's another case study. So this is a, a defect at a VT. So this is a rackable VT on an 11 kV switchboard. Uh, this one here, the, the, the main reason that this one, um, or not the main reason, but this one occurred on Christmas Eve. So we found the PD activity by the monitor on, on Christmas Eve. Within two hours, we'd notified the customer, and then within another two hours, they had people down there and they'd switched out that VT. The reason that they switched this VT out so quickly is because they had skeleton staff that were going to uh, run the network over, over Christmas. They didn't want a failure on Christmas Day or Boxing Day or any, anything around there. Um, and that reduced their risk over the Christmas period. When they pulled the VT out, the, the damage was not extensive, but it was causing PD activity. In the top right hand uh, picture there, you can see one of the bushings that, that makes up the VT. And um, in the bottom right of that, you can see some, some uh, it's like a light brown area. And that's where there was a bit of damage to the bushing from when it had last been racked in. Also, the, the spring tension on the contact wasn't set correctly and there was a bit of a gap behind the spring and that was causing PD activity to build up inside that connection and it was, it was um, uh, giving off you know, PD activity at that point. And this is our last case study. This is a, an air insulated cable box. So this one here, we, we, um, we installed a monitor on the, on the whole switchboard here. We conducted a benchmark survey with the handheld equipment. We didn't find any PD signals within this cable box at all on the, on the day. But uh, three months later, we saw a spike in activity, which is highlighted there by the red uh, arrow on that graph. The spike in activity occurred. We, it didn't go up to you know, high levels, but it was at a, a medium, low towards medium level. And we notified the customer, we said, but we, um, we'd like you to go down there and just confirm what we're hearing. And so the customer went down there, one of their engineers with a, um, an Ultratev Plus 2. He listened into the cable box with an ultrasonic sensor and he confirmed that PD was occurring inside there. He was comfortable to, to let that sit for a little while because they had a lot going on on that network. Um, he said, if, this, if things get worse, let me know, but I'm booking an outage as soon as I can. That outage occurred one month later. When they took the outage, they opened up the cable box and they found what you can see in the bottom right hand uh, picture there where you've got three phases coming up into the cable box. Two of those phases were too close to each other and that was causing discharge activity to occur across the phases. So what we were able to do here, or what they were able to do was we picked it up very, very, very early and it was an, a very easy fix for the, for the customer. What they were able to do was increase the clearances between those two phases by separating them. They were able to clean up that area and they, they, uh, they found that there was an extensive damage there where they needed to replace heat shrink or, or replace the termination itself, which would have been a, a very large job. So they were able to find it early, an easy, quick fix relative to a failure or relative to leaving it there for months and months and months and it really ate away at the insulation and they'd have to, if they did find it, they'd have to replace it anyway. So that gave uh, good value with that one. Okay, we've got the summary there, but let's just take, let's just have a look at some of the questions that we, um, we're waiting to answer. So, um, if we go, how, uh, Right, okay, we've done the, I think there was one for earlier on, Tommy. Oh, was there one for Tommy? Tommy. Oh, this? Ah, here. With fixed PD monitoring, how and where would you fix modules to capture PD? That's quite an interesting one. So the, for transient earth voltages, TV tends to travel. So it, it, it travels across the surface. There's a, the, the sparks due to the skin effect will travel quite readily across the surface of the, um, of the metalwork. So we typically only put one, have sensor on on each cubicle or every other cubicle if we're trying to reduce cost and got very large switchboards so we what we can do because it's a relatively simple case to replace uh, to to reposition due to the magnetic nature we we usually put one on an appropriate part of the, the switch gear depending on the type so we 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 make an assessment of the type of the switch gear the construction Sometimes we'll put two two sensors, but generally it's one or one every other, um, and we'll see where signals will, will go. So that's how we'll make an assessment on the TV because it will it will transfer. With the ultrasonic, it's a slightly different thing. Ultrasonic sensors have to be pointing into the right chamber. 
So if we're pointing into a cable box and we've got PD in that cable box, which is similar to what Brad just showed there, then that's not necessarily going to be the same sensor that would pick up something in a bus bar. So we would typically put one in each of the air chambers that we're interested in and maybe a few on the bus bars. Because bus bars generally don't have um, segregation between them, then uh, one or two per section of bus is usually enough to cover the bus. And then the other ones that we're pointing in towards air filled chambers. On the switch gear that we saw failed in the UK, then the biggest cause of the failure was, was typically tracking on the circuit breaker. So you would be pointing towards the spout in that particular instance there. So how and where we, we, did, yeah, we, we place the sensors it is dictated to a certain extent by the type of switch key, and that's where we, we usually have knowledge of that. Um, how often does the astute need to be calibrated for its accuracy? Uh, again, an interesting question. The, um, formally, uh, we often calibrate things every, every two years for a, an installed monitor, or we, we do a check on that. The, the system itself does automatic checking on this. Um, and there's another fundamental question. Some people don't actually go for a calibration once they've installed a monitor. Uh, you know if it's working or not. It has got its auto checking. And the, the, the other aspect is, uh, what are, are you really interested in the exact number? Is it 23 dB or 24 dB? Or are you interested in the, the alarm capability and the function and what is changing and, and trending? So if, if one of the sensors were, for example, to drift, so it's reading 1 dB out, fundamentally it's not realistically going to make much of a difference in terms of the, um, uh, of, of the, the answer and the diagnostic. But, but typically you can go in there, say, every two years and check each of the individual sensors. Um, does one node support one RFCT? Uh, on the particular nodes that you saw in the pictures where you've got a... A tab sent two tab sensors, two um, ultrasonic. That particular node supports one RFCT. We've also got another node which supports. It's a standalone cable node which will support three RFCT. So you can have a combination of those in the chain, so you can make sure that you're you're testing the cables, uh, particularly when you've got multiple phases per multiple cables per phase on on some circuits. Um, have we ever had a case where we've opened a switchboard a cable and found nothing wrong or vice versa? Uh, that's a good one as well. That's from Roger, I think, in New Zealand. Yep. So um, when, you, when you're finding TEV activity and you open something up, you often don't see anything because it's in the inside of the installation. So you, you'll open up a, a CT chamber, for example, on Rayroll LMT, and it will look absolutely perfect, but inside it's discharging. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can't see it. The, the compound insulated cable box that Brad showed on the, on the case study, it'd be very difficult to actually find a problem in that. Uh, by the time you melted the compound out, it may have gone, uh, although it, it, it can be. So sometimes it's difficult to find something. Early stages of ultrasonic can be difficult to find at times. It will make a mark. If you get an ultrasonic sensors, it will be on the surface, so it will be affecting insulation. Uh, we often you have, you have to use strong light sources, mirrors, things like that to make sure that you're assessing something. So the earlier you go in there, the quicker the fix, but at the same time, uh, the less damage that has been done for you, enabled you to see it. So you do have uh, that, um, that thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't actually had a failure uh, on, on the, our Australia, New Zealand um, monitor, monitors, mm -hmm. touch, touching wood. Yeah. Um, we've, we've prevented quite a few. We haven't actually had a, a failure occurring on our watch. Uh, it mm -hmm. could happen. I uh, have to say it could happen. You could see, you know, we, we're not claiming nobody, uh, if anyone does claim that partial discharge will find every single fault, then they're telling lies. There, are, there will be elements of, of failure out there which, which we won't see before it fails. Quick ones. Yeah, often the quick ones. Cables, another one, if you had uh, a defect inside the solid element of the XLP cable, that potentially will accelerate to failure very, very quickly before the monitor really has had a chance to, 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 um, to see an, an upsurge as well. 
So that's another thing that could potentially cause problems. Yeah. Um, Got one here from Jason Murray. Uh, when PD is found, what's the next step? So we contact you for analysis. Yeah, that's and we that's do it ourselves. Uh, or do it do it yourself. That's either or. That that's what we tend to do. So on our monitoring. Uh, on our monitoring service contracts, we're, we're there as, as a point of call. Um, we understand the switch key, we understand the, the types of, of defects, and we can help with that next stage. We don't always need to do that. We can talk people through that, guide people through that. So the um, it, it happens both ways, and, it, and it's usually a collaborative thing. We, we would never walk away from a set because the one thing that you want is, as, as an industry, what we all want is to learn from from things that we found. So if we've got an element of, if we find discharge signals, somebody opens it up, we actually want to know what, what they saw and we want to learn from that to improve ongoing um, the sort of service and, and the uh, diagnostics that we can make. Mm. Six months annual for medium consequences when you're referring to online periodic testing, I test on those. Yeah, um, we're not talking yeah. um, online. We're, we're, when we're talking about the periods, we're, we're, we're effectively talking online. The, it's quite interesting in, in Australia, there was lots of companies who would say that they were going to test switch gear every 12 months on, offline. I uh, don't think it really happens as often as, um, as all that anymore. You've got to um, also understand if you're testing offline, you're taking switch gear out of service, you're potentially not testing the cable termination because you're, you're the capacitance of the cable. So you wouldn't be able to test cable termination, the VT, and they're two critical areas. But we're talking online in terms of our, our periods, yeah. yeah. It's got one last question here from Andrew Hill. When I recommend to a client this astute should be installed, what is the typical ongoing cost of monitoring in 2020? Um, yes, the slides are available for download. The ongoing cost is um, is, is not excessive. Uh, it just depends on the uh, the number of panels and everything else. So um, it can be as uh, it can be down to uh, a couple of thousand or a thousand dollars a month for a certain switchboards. It can be more than that. So it really does depend. So, so if Andrew, if you wanted to give us a, an indication of a, an SLD, we can give you a very good. Um, we can give you an indication very quickly on that, but you're looking at a small, small number of thousand dollars per um, per switchboard per month is typical for a completely leased system with um, uh, full analysis and everything else. Okay. A copy of the slides will be made available. We um, we also have on this last slide here. We've got our contact details. So, um, oh, she's starting to chuck now. Uh, so Brad and I will be um, more than happy to to take questions, uh, take calls, uh, um, and and uh, go one on one with with any of you if you want to to go into any uh, any depth of uh, any of the topics we've covered here. So you can. Uh, I think everybody gets to see the, um, the the answers to the polls. So we've got um, we got expert users, um, we've got uh, and people in the middle, which is where you would expect most people to be, as well as people who are learning out. So some of the the guys who have got very limited experience, we've gone over that uh, theory very very quickly, um, and we're we're going to be very happy to. Um, to do a webinar on more of the fundamentals should they be required. So the the topics that uh, people are interested in, Brad, on the poll. Sorry. Yeah, everybody's always interested in PD case studies and seeing the black and crispy switch gear, particularly if it's not yours. So uh, yeah, we've <laughs> we've, um, we've got um, lots of case studies that we can we can present. So we could put a webinar together on that, so we will do that for you. Uh, it's still moving, so people are still voting. Um, oh, it's neck and neck, handheld PD instruments as well. They would go hand in hand, so we could do handheld instruments and the case studies you find on them as well. So we'll we'll take note of the, the final results of the poll and feedback that we're getting, and we will um, 
uh, we will publish and let everybody know what the, the next topic will be and that will be done shortly. And thank you for all your thank yous. Yeah, what I'm saying, thank you. Thanks guys, thanks for logging in. Okay, no problem. Uh, stay safe. Stay and, safe everyone. Um, we look forward to hearing. Yeah. Any hearing questions, from. just shoot them through and, and we'll get back to you. No problem. Cool. Bye.